not uh, being a person of faith, I didn't have to start my discussion by whatever Arabic uh, sentence you, you had to start yours with. I'm free to start it with however I want, which is I find liberating. Now, let me first say, I, I want to thank you very much for your, the kind graciousness with which you invited me. And um, I'm very hesitant to say some of the things I'm going to say, because I learned to be polite to your hosts. But I think it's polite in some sense to, to try and, uh, to try and um, point out nonsense when nonsense is there, even if, even, if, uh, even if it's offensive. So I'm sorry that I'm sure I will offend some people in this audience. Um, I generally offend people in every audience, so you should feel not particularly special. Certainly, there are limits to science. As, it, as an empiricist, which is what I am, um, empirically, there are limits to what science can do. In fact, in my own field, cosmology, there are clearly limits because we are we, are, um, we have one universe to, to observe, and most of us live in that universe. The Republican Party in my country doesn't, but <laughs> but but um, the the uh, there so therefore Info because of that there may be many universes, and therefore there's a, obviously in some real physical sense a limited domain over which we can explore, and that's the key point. It's not just tools. All of every academic discipline uses tools, and, they're, and in some ways they're not that different. But, but the key part of what, what makes science science and what makes it work is it's based on empirical evidence, sort of rational thought applied to empirical evidence. And therefore, if you can't measure it, even in principle, I mean, there's lots of things we can't measure that we can talk about. As a theoretical physicist, I think about things a lot, a lot of things we can't measure right now. But if you can't ever measure it in principle, then then science really has nothing to say about it. I would argue that m anything else you tend to say about it is not worth much either. But, uh, uh, but it's certainly Careful. a fact that science generally can't address it if you can't measure it in principle. And, and that's, um, that's a fundamental importance, I think, and we forget that. And so I think um, the difference that I would say is that the limits, I don't, is that I don't know what the ultimate limits to science are. There are limits now. And there are many areas where science has very little to say right now. But can I say that it will never have anything to say about it? Absolutely not. There's a huge difference between what's unknowable and what's not known. And so the only way you can find out if science has anything to say about it is try. Right. And if it, if it has something useful to say, then make pr predictions which agree with experiments, then it, you can make progress. But you can try it. And it might not work. And an example, right. you know, might be sort of sociology, where they tried to use the language of physics to apply to societies, and it was far too premature, that too, right. much too complex. And consciousness, which is, as I was telling Dan, if I, you know, I, right. I did physics because it's easy. If I want to do the hard stuff, mm -hmm. I do consciousness. Right. We don't have absolute truths in science, unlike religion. That's the reason that science makes progress, because <laughs> we can change our minds. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really important thing that we we. As I often say, if you're a theoretical physicist, the two most important states to be in are either wrong or confused. Because that means there's a lot left to learn. A it's hard lot? to imagine. I mean, given that there are over 100 billion stars in our galaxy, we now have learned that most of those stars have planets around them, so solar systems. 100 billion galaxies with all those stars and galaxies. And we also know that there's lots of water out there, organic molecules, and sunlight, which is all that was necessary for life to evolve here on Earth. So it's hard to imagine it hasn't evolved well, and, somewhere and else. Most I find it amazing that here we are in this random planet, in this random place in the middle of nowhere, and we have, through our minds and, and the fact that we're graced with consciousness, been able to understand the, early, the universe to the earliest moments of the Big Bang. I think it's worth celebrating. These are ideas that are fascinating. Part of the benefit of science, we always talk about technology, and of course, science is responsible for everything in this room almost. But, but for me, science is as important for its ideas and its impact on our culture. It's like great art and literature and music. It, it's, it, what's, it's what makes being human worth being human. Mm -hmm. There are PhD scientists who question evolution, and this question of lists was brought up a number of times. And, um, and the point is, you can find PhD scientists that will say absolutely anything. The great thing that is not recognized about science, again, is that there are no scientific authorities. That's an anathema to science authority. There are scientific experts, and even they can be wrong. They're not authorities. A graduate student can disagree and be right. And I absolutely agree with John Calvert that that statement of the 48 Nobel laureates, by the way, was a stupid statement. Nobel laureates can be wrong. 
I have a lot of friends who are Nobel laureates, and I, and I can ver verify they're wrong a lot. Okay? Now, as far as these lists are concerned, here's one of many uh, um, uh, advertisements that were given to show that there's 100 science, PhD scientists in that particular poll that didn't believe in Darwinism. To point out the silliness of this, the National Center for Science Education produced a uh, program which I called Bringing in the Steves, but um, uh, we got, uh, they and I helped them get uh, the, uh, statements from 500 scientists named Steve, including every Nobel laureate named Steve, to support an evolution, to point out that basically getting 100 scientists to say anything doesn't prove anything. And, 100 P and having a PhD doesn't make you a scientist. It means you have a PhD. This is an amazing picture. Because it's a picture of gravitational lensing. It's a picture that results from the fact that space is curved. So you don't have to be a rocket scientist, to, as, as Sam Ting would say, to, to, um, to see that you know, you, this is a cluster of galaxies. And as George pointed out, clusters of galaxies are the largest bound objects in the universe. Maybe almost 10 million light years across from side to side. They're the biggest bound objects in the universe, and anything that can fall into anything will fall into a cluster. So if you can weigh the clusters, you can weigh the universe. And, uh, and, and, every, and like many of the images you've seen before, every, every dot in this picture is a galaxy, not a star. Each of these galaxies contains hundreds of billions of stars. This is a cluster that's five billion light years away. Five billion light years away. So the light from those stars left before the Earth even formed. Okay, and by similar token, if, if, if there were beings on that cluster that w looked at us that, and saw the light that's happening now, we'd long be gone by the same they, time they watched. And in fact, most of the stars in this image may not even exist anymore. They may have ended their lives. And the civilizations that may have existed around them and had meetings like this are no longer. And I mean, that's, I, I think that's really important because we may talk about spirituality, but real, this is real spirituality. This, when you look at this, images like this, they, they inspire you in ways that nothing else I, I know of to, can inspire. It's this question of historical science. It has been pointed out, as we've heard today, that somehow evolution is in historical science. There are, there, well, in fact, here's a wonderful, John Bacon, who was a Kansas State board mem uh, member, you probably know him, John, um, said, I, I can't understand what they're squealing about. Millions of, or billions of years ago, I wasn't here and neither were they. Okay? Well, that, that policy issue, in fact, of course, doesn't under, totally misrepresents science. There is no such thing as historical science, or rather, all science is historical science. In fact, the National Academy of, of Sciences hit, said it this way in, in, a, in a document. They said, this misses the point about how science tests hypotheses. We don't see the Earth going around the sun or atoms that make up matter. We see their consequences. Scientists infer that atoms exist and the Earth revolves because they've tested predictions derived from these concepts by extensive observation and experimentation. All science is historical science. Every science. Physics is historical science. We base physics on experiments that have been performed in the past or observations that have been made in the past. But that doesn't make them historical, purely. Because the whole point of what makes them a science is that you then predict the future. And evolutionary biology is exactly like other sciences in that sense. We make, make observations that are past, but we then make predictions about observations that have not yet been made. We predict the future. Or experiments that have been, not yet been performed about genetic resemblances and, 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 and uh, susceptibility to viruses among different species. These are experiments that aren't been performed. We make predictions about them. We test them. And when they agree, that's the science, and that's how evolutionary biology has survived for the last 150 years. So all historical science predicts the future. If it was just storytelling, it wouldn't be science. The question isn't, isn't re is religion important? Because that's an obvious thing. Religion is obviously important. So are nuclear weapons. The, the, the question is, is religion outmoded, and are nuclear weapons outmoded? And would the world be a better place without them? And the answer, both those, is yes. Uh, okay, religion is very important, nuclear weapons are very important, but neither of them in the modern world serve a productive purpose. And so I, I think that I, I, def, I, I accept and don't need to debate the question of whether religion is an important part of, of the way the world is run. The question is, should it be, uh, should it continue to be, and is it decreasing? And in fact, what also hasn't been pointed out is that in m most places, and in fact happily, monotonically in the, in the first world, um, the people identifying themselves as religious is decreasing year by year. The first year in England, by the way, as you know from a recent poll, more than a, 
fit more than half the population finally acknowledged that they, they didn't have any religious affiliation. In the United States, even, it's been decreasing in spite of the efficiency of competition. Why not introduce intelligent design in a biology classroom after all, and then discuss why, as a straw man, why it has its flaws, etc.? Won't students learn something? Well, undeniably, they will learn something. I think that's true. But why introduce a straw man? Why not talk about real scientific controversies? If you really are interested in critical thinking, produce real controversies that you can talk to students about. In my own field of physics, the nature of gravity, there's a lot more scientific papers saying that Newton's wrong than there are saying Darwin's wrong. Okay, that's a controversy. Why, why is gravity under attack? Quantum mechanics, basis of modern physics. I have a friend of mine, again, who's a Nobel laureate, who's, doesn't, who thinks that a fundamental level quantum mechanics is wrong. It's, and, and I think it, there, it's in some ways developing into a minor controversy. In biology, why not talk about natural selection, random mutation, and the issue of how, of, of how they interact? And, and there are controversies from people who believe in, in the relevant significance of those things. Those are real controversies. They're not fake ones. And if you want students to learn about controversies in science, talk about the controversies that actually exist. That is much more effective critical thinking. Okay. The key thing that I think both Richard and I want to do is excite people about the, the wonders of reality, about the real universe and how amazing it is. And, and, instead of, and, and realize that they don't need this fake universe of myth and superstition. For me, that's what drives me. Is I think, and, and as an aside, I think people ultimately lo lose religion. But personally, I'm driven more by getting people excited about the real universe. And you might say, and I've had this discussion with at least one or two of the people who were in the beginning and end of the film, one in particular that I know of, whether, you know, if people find solace in something, is it, you know, is it reasonable or justifiable to argue that, that what they're finding solace in is, is not right? Well, I don't think either Richard or I would go to someone's deathbed who's, who's clinging on that and say, oh, you know, forget it. But, but uh, well, it depends who they are, actually. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but, um, but, the, but the problem is that it's not innocuous. That, the, that, that, as a, that beliefs, as I think I said in the film, that beliefs in things that aren't true inevitably produce actions which, which are harm, often harmful. And so if it was just innocuous, I, th I think I'd feel a lot less uh, worried about it. But it's not innocuous. And therefore, I think it's really important to try and convince people to base their actions on reality. And uh, on the whole, while that may hurt it's some people, on, I think on the whole it leads to a better society. Of course religion is outdated in the 21st century. Um, most religious people, to respond, it's, it's true that you may get many people saying they're religious, but none of them, uh, to, in the first world at least, in the developed world, to first approximation, actually believe the doctrines of their faith. They like to be religious, they want to believe to use something from the X-Files. They, they, they want to believe in believing. So that Catholics don't really believe that when, they, that when a priest holds a wafer, it turns into the body of Christ. No one really believes that nonsense. I have, in the last week, for, for spent more time talking to Jewish atheists than, than I can count. Most of the Jews I know are atheists. And they say it's perfectly reasonable to be Jewish atheists because there's other aspects of the Jewish religion they like. So the point is that the doctrines of religion w are outdated, and that's for good reason. They were created by Bronze Age or Iron Age peasants who didn't even know the Earth orbited the sun. So, those, so the wisdom in those books is not wisdom at all. And people take the wisdom. In fact, we've actually learned something over the last 20 centuries, and, and science has taught us how the world works. Now, for science, the interesting thing as a scientist is that uh, God is completely irrelevant to science. Most scientists don't spend enough time thinking about God to even know if they're atheists because they try and understand how the world works and God never enters into it. It's just completely irrelevant. And in fact, the more we've learned about the natural world, the more we've learned that you don't need any divine intervention to explain anything. As far as morality is concerned and the person you want to be, which is really what, what I think is the heart of what, what religion... when. Religion provides many things for people, and we can't deny that. The question is, how can we take the things that people need, community, uh, support, hope, and, and use the real world to build those quantities? Because religion, if you base your beliefs and your actions on myths that are incorrect, you're ine inevitably going to take irrational actions. 
And so what we want to do is, is, is what science does, which is force people's beliefs to conform to the evidence of reality rather than the other way around, and not assume the answers to questions before we even ask them, and use the rational world